Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the director of the Institute for Emerging Issues, Anita Brown Graham. I just want to say that whole voiceover thing is very cool, very, very cool. All right. So back to work. Thank you all for coming in and taking your seats quickly. Gotta love it. Look at all those people in the back of the room coming in, taking their seats quickly. No pressure, no shame. We've got three segments to go today. We'll end with a powerful message on the corridors that will take us from where we are to where we hope to be. Before then, we'll ourselves select our own state priorities. But all of that is premised on what our policymakers are thinking about as they push the levers toward future work. And so I'm pretty excited that in this next panel, we'll hear from leaders from across the political spectrum who will talk about the role that public policy has to play as technology and demography shift the ground from under our very feet in North Carolina. The key question for them will be how they use public policy to help scale the kind of change we've been talking about all day today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you now my friend, Tim Boyum of News 14, who's here today to moderate this panel and to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Tim Boyum. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, thank you, Anita, for the kind introduction and for again being a part of this. We've got an excellent group of civic leaders here with us today, so let's begin. Let's introduce them, our panelists. Senator Chad Barefoot is co-chairman of the Workforce and Economic Development Committee. He also represents Wake and Franklin counties in the North Carolina Senate. Tim Moore is speaker of the North Carolina House of Representatives. He represents Cleveland County. Rick Glazier is executive director of the North Carolina Justice Center and former NC State representative from Cumberland County. And finally, John Hood is chairman of the John Locke Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panelists. All right, for the first part of this discussion, uh, we're going to talk with our, our lawmakers that we have here. And of course, economic development is a big part of this. Uh, North Carolina is undergoing a shift from its three-tier ranking system. So, Senator Barefoot, what are your thoughts on the potential impact of, of this change of this ranking system and in light of these impending changes that we've been talking about here today? Well, thank you, Tim, for having me here, and thank you to the Emerging Issues Institute for welcoming us on the stage. Um, currently in the General Assembly, the Economic Development uh, Committee is listening to proposals by the uh, Department of Commerce and other agencies on how we can do a better job with our economic development tier ranking systems. I have the unique opportunity in the legislature of representing one of the fastest growing urban areas in the state, but also a rural county that has different demographic makeups uh, throughout the county. Uh, what I know about the proposals that have come forward so far, I don't think the legislature has decided on anything yet, is that we we know that there is a need to take into account more of the changes that are prevalent in these counties. For example, in the southern part of Franklin County that I represent, you'll find a totally different economic environment than the northern part. In Wake County, you'll find a different economic environment in Wake Forest than you will in Zebulon, and you find a drastically different uh, environment than in downtown Raleigh. And so do we have an economic development plan 
that sees all of those differences. And so the thrust of the changes centers around moving away from typical demographic indicators such as population growth, population size, poverty, to more acute um, areas of economic distress in those different geographic locations to appropriate funds and resources accordingly. Speaker Moore, if you can, talk a little bit about how these rankings impact these actual committees, what their communities, what, what they mean for them, and why a potential change might be necessary. Well, thank you for having us here today. We're glad to be here. And uh, I know a number of my colleagues, by the way, from the House are here. So uh, if you see them, please let them know. I know Representative Ross is back there, and I saw Representative Reeves earlier. In answer to your question, Tim, we know that there are challenges that uh, they vary around the state. And I think that the Senator made a point that you know, the urban areas continue to be very vibrant. Uh, you can walk outside this building and see massive construction going on in Wake County, but you don't see that in a lot of our rural areas. And so we know that the plans that we have in place right now have, the times have changed and we need to take a look at how we do our tier systems because you may, for example, have a county that is thrive, that, that overall may be say a tier three county but it may have a particular community and they are a region of the county that is struggling. So we're, we're looking at ways to, to tweak what we have in place, but it's important because when these counties are competing with other communities, not just within North Carolina, but primarily outside of the state, if, if you have a rural area, say uh, Edgecombe County is competing for a manufacturing facility with a rural county in Alabama, you need to have all the incentives available and the, and the infrastructure in place where they can be the most competitive. We know that's a big, big part, but also the overall state policy when it comes to tax, regu regulatory reform, and just general good government. Speaking of tax, there's been a lot of changes in recent years. Do we need to examine the tax policy to reward direct investments in jobs versus capital expenditures? Well, I think in last year's um, budget bill, which included our tax reform plan, uh, we took a, a large step in the right direction of doing that by moving, putting the state on a path towards single sales factor. So no longer are we going to a portion based off of payroll, which is employees, or property, which is capital for corporations, only on sales. And that, that's a big uh, policy piece that I think reflects a lot of what this conference has been talking about today in looking towards the future and looking at what types of tax policies may be incentivizing where industry and work is going. Same question to you. Do we need to change the tax policy further? Well, we, we did make great strides this past session with lowering the personal income tax, lowering the corporate income tax, the single sales factor, which was a part of House Bill 117. These are all huge changes, I think, that have moved our state in the right direction. And I think part of what we need to do is, and we've had several, at least four years in a row, of tax reduction and tax reform. Uh, certainly we may, need, we may need to make some tweaks along the way, but we also need to make sure uh, how the implementation is going, the changes that we've made so far to make sure that uh, we don't want to just keep changing every year and every year. We know what the eventual goal is, but I think we need to make also take an assessment of where we are right now, and I think we need to continue to get input from folks just like in this room to make sure that what we're doing at the state level is actually working when it's, uh, when it's on the ground. Skills gap, it's almost been a buzz phrase for the last several years talking about issues in North Carolina uh, as technology continues. Uh, what further policies or new policies do we need in the state, do you think, to, to continue to address the skills gap? So I think most of them are going to surround our education system uh, at the K-12 through system, the community college, and even now the university system. A few things I'd like to point out from just my experience uh, working in the legislature, being around public policy, that surrounds education and, and knowing that um, our laws can be good, but our systems are only going to be as good as the institutions and the leaders who, who control those institutions. And one of the things that I've found to be very impactful is leadership in and around the realm of workforce development. Uh, there is no leader in North Carolina of workforce development. We have leaders of our different education institutions, and they kind of come together on the NC Works Commission board, but unless they take those ideas and those thoughts back to their institutions and implement them aggressively and aggressively try to stay up on what the needs of the workforce are, uh, you're going to have shortages in these areas. So leadership is a big component. The second, and that's not, that's not a public policy component. The second piece that uh, is 
almost as important as leadership is going to be the public policy that surrounds um, these leadership changes. We have got to create public policy that pushes in this direction, and I'll give you one example of that. Um, education curriculum in K-12. I don't know what the answer is, but I can tell you what one of the problems is. The skills that I believe uh, that have replaced the jobs that we had 10 or 15 years ago, maybe working on a manufacturing floor. I have a brother-in-law who is a mechanical engineer. He designs robots that paint chairs instead of people in High Point in Thomasville, North Carolina. And so where they've replaced five or six people who do that job with two or three machines that do that job, but those machines need uh, people who can have high skills to operate them. The problem, though, is those same workers were never prepared with the math skills that they needed or the science skills or, or the many skills or the collaborative skills, the soft skills in high school that they needed to get the degree at the community college they need to go into that subject area. A lot of businesses tell us, policymakers, we want to start talking to these students in middle school. And a pushback I get on this issue is we don't want to create like a German style track system. But the conclusion I've come to is that the, even if you're on a career technical education track, the, the courses you choose in high school, maybe even middle school, are as impactful to what happens to you as anything. You can't make that decision when you're 16 and 17 years old anymore. And I think one of the biggest problems that faces us in career technical education, which leads to workforce development, is the fact that our community college system is open enrollment. Anybody can enroll, but you have to be able to pass college level math and reading to graduate with the associate's degree. And so that's a big barrier for our students. They have to start making decisions earlier in their educational career because the skills require more input on their part earlier on in their education. Speaker Moore, we hear about STEM classes, we hear about digital textbooks, which are obviously all very good and important, but is that enough to prepare the future generations for the, the future work? Well, I think we also need to look at you know, industry recognized certificates, making sure that the, the programs that, that, folk, that students are completing in the community colleges will in fact lead to a job, and I think the community colleges have done a good job in, in working that. The General Assembly is working to make sure that current laws address that, that we, that we are in fact making sure those opportunities are available to all students. We, we also want to continue strengthening STEM-based uh, uh, learning because we know that's the future. As a matter of fact, if you'll notice in the bonds package that, that's on the ballot in the primary, it has a heavy focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. That's where we see the future of the state. So we want to make sure that we're also fully funding that and that we're making those opportunities available. We also know that apprenticeship programs are, are very important. So you, I think you will see continued emphasis on that as well. The, the, the other balance is making sure that, that the pathway to a career, whether it's through the community colleges or whether it's through the universities, that there's a clear pathway where folks can take what they learn and find a job at the end of that. I want to bring Rick and John into this conversation. Let's go back to the tier system for a minute. I know, Rick, you have a, probably a, a strong opinion on this. The, the, the three-tier ranking system, should it change, and, and how do you think that impacts uh, considering future work? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and, and I, I do think that um, the tier system needs a change, and addressing the tier system is part of uh, addressing the geographic inequalities that exist across the state. And there certainly are multiple measures. Commerce is looking at one, I think, um, and CETA has another model that's out there. But what I want to emphasize a little bit is that it's just a small part of addressing the inequalities. The, the real need is to develop systems that, that boost wages uh, to living wages, that make sure communities are connected regionally <clears throat> and globally, and that we ensure, just as Speaker Moore actually just said, that there is a strong commitment to public investment as the foundation uh, of, of the infrastructure and the strong economic infrastructure that's needed in the state. In that sense, I think the tiers do need to be changed. They were for a different time, um, and they don't necessarily reflect the poverty within urban districts, let alone the difference between, real difference between urban and rural districts. But at a more uh, important level, I think, is to say that is the small first step. And I think we also have to recognize, recognize that those inequalities go across the spectrum in terms of educational opportunities, K-12, community colleges and universities. They go across the road and infrastructure system of the state. They go across our commitment 
uh, to the universities uh, in all of its aspects, not just uh, its teaching capacity, but really allowing them to develop vibrant research capacity in their geographic areas. And so I think it's important to put the tier question in perspective of the broader inequality question, which I think is a big one for the state. John, if you had the keys to the car of the state and could do this yourself, would, how would you do it? If I had the keys to the car, I think Rick Glazer would, would get on a different road. Um, what, what I would say is that the tier system clearly is a best guess. You know, we all know there are more than three categories. We all know that to describe an entire county as fitting one or another tier is a bit of an abstraction that doesn't really fit reality. So tweaking it or changing it in some way I think is reasonable. But I'm going to go in a little bit different direction on that, which is to say it's not obvious that grouping the counties into the three tiers and attempting to steer uh, economic development and businesses into the most distressed tier has really had all that much effect on those counties. It's a good attempt. It was a good attempt. Uh, the effects have been unclear. A lot of the economic development projects uh, end up in the, the nice, the, the uh, urban counties, the metropolitan areas, and even the higher end uh, uh, economic, socioeconomic parts of those counties. So even if you look at a Mecklenburg or a Wake or a Guilford and you look at where the, the economic development project went, a lot of times it's in the one of the higher uh, income parts of the, of, the, uh, of the county. So I think having some realism here and being skeptical about how changing the formula is going to ultimately change the facts on the ground is, is important and warranted. And you thought John and I wouldn't agree on anything. It's being recorded, so we'll make sure we keep track of that. Speaker Moore, you're from Aurelia. I mean, I want to address this, this urban-rural issue is, is underlying basically everything in the state right now, particularly when it comes to economic development in the state. Speaker Moore, you're from a more rural area. I mean, we, we keep hearing technology is the great equalizer, but, but is that enough? I mean, it is, it, when we talk about future work, it, is that enough to, to vitalize North Carolina's rural areas to keep pace with our urban folks? Well, I do think the economic incentives have a role to play and I represent Cleveland County, which is a rural area, and I've seen projects that we've, we've gotten over the years where we were competing against other states. And I can tell you that the economic development incentives did in fact make a huge difference. Uh, we have a lot of other things going for, just in my counties we have around the state. Uh, good roads, good education, strong community colleges, a commitment from the university, a very favorable regulatory environment. But sometimes those, those incentives uh, can make the difference when things are on the bubble, when folks are looking at other, at other states. And I can tell you that it's uh, an area like Raleigh or Charlotte doesn't necessarily need the same level of that to land a company that some of the more rural areas uh, require, and that's just a reality. But I've seen where they've actually benefited the rural areas. So whether you do a tier system or something else, that's important. The other key thing, though, is making sure that at the local level that you have a strong economic development partnership at the county and at the municipal level, that they're out actually actively recruiting these companies, that they have sites identified or sites ready to be developed. That's, that to me is probably the biggest and strongest thing where I've seen the rural counties that have succeeded to, to have that ready, where when they know of an industry that's looking to build a, you know, some sort of manufacturing facility, that they have a site ready space where they can come in and then all those other things build on top of that. Senator Barefoot, you talked about a little bit, and, you, and Speaker Moore did too, about you know, the, the K through 12, and you mentioned the, the, the German system. Uh, but are, are there other things that K through 12 needs to do to specifically to adapt to this, this future work that's out there that's looming in the future? Well, one of the things that I've noticed that a lot of students don't get, and I've really, you know, we have pushed higher education in the state very aggressively, specifically the attainment of four-year degrees. But many of our students do not go on that path. And so the question is, what happens to them? When I was growing up in a manufacturing town in Thomasville, North Carolina, I had buddies who dropped out at 16 to go enter the economy. They would never call themselves dropouts. They were ready to work, they had a job, and they knew it would provide the type of living that they wanted. Those days don't exist anymore, and so one of the questions is, what's happening to those students? What I have found is that career advisement is greatly lacking in our educational institutions. And, and I would submit to you, a, a lot of people say, well, the parents need to do more. 
But I would submit that a lot of parents that choose to put their children in private education do so not just because of the educational attainment that they might get, but because of the outcomes those schools received in terms of their placement and the advising that they do. And we don't do that aggressively enough in the public system. I think there are a lot of students that come into the system and they, if they're on the career track, and when I say career, I mean they are, they're probably headed to the community college. If they are on that track, they don't work that hard because the community college system will accept them no matter how well they do, but then they get there and they cannot compete. They cannot take the, they, they are forced in remedial education and only 8% of those students actually end up getting a degree. And so I think we have got to start advising our students early on about the essential types of classes they need to be able to get career and technical education in the state. Rick, we're going to give you the keys now. How, how do you fix K through 12 to be ready for future work? Well, I want to follow um, uh, Senator Barefoot's comment, and, and I, I, I agree with his analysis uh, that there is, uh, as an example, an advising or counseling issue. Where I think we may disagree is one of the basic reasons that exists is that we may only have or fund four to five counselors for a 1,500 to 1,700 to 2,000 person high school. And, and we expect counselors, for example, uh, to be sort of jack of all trades and to help on the testing. And by the time we get to actually having time to counsel all those students who are at very gradations, um, it, there's, 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 there's really an enormous capacity problem in the public schools. And so I think um, it is really important what you said, and I agree, I've, I've argued for a long time about counseling and advising. Um, but it's equally important for us to say, aside from looking at the issues of curriculum, aside from looking at the issues of, of, of how we address um, um, a career and technical education, at a base level, um, we have got to find a way to answer the question that's happened in great depth, and that is uh, the lack of people going into the teaching field, the lack of people staying in the teaching field, and the real reasons for that, and they're varied. But to suggest as well um, uh, that money isn't one of them, I think would be wrong. And so we've got to come together, I think, and find answers, bipartisan answers, on the issues of how to seriously sustain uh, resources to the public schools, resources to teaching, resources to the administrative capacity to support teaching, or really what's going to happen is that we're all talking about issues uh, that, are, that are sort of, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, we're talking about putting new shingles on a burning roof. And I don't think that's going to work. So I think we've got to get to what's underlying uh, the building and causing the building to burn to begin with. What? By the applause, you can tell teacher pays an issue. Speaker Moore, we just happened to have you on the program last week talking about this issue. So why, well, as long as that came up, why don't you address that issue? Well, we're certainly committed to seeing that uh, teachers and other state employees, for that matter, receive a uh, pay raise, something we advocated in our house budget was 2%, and we're hoping to have something even more robust than that this year. Of course, we're waiting to see what the final revenue numbers are. And, you know, when it comes to public education, it's, it's not really a, it's, it's a political issue, but it's personal. I have two sons, one who's in public high school, the other's in public middle school. And I want the best for them and every other student in this state. I think the, uh, the advisement, the, the advising is, is, is a good point. Uh, we're lucky to have good advisors, but there is a, there is a situation or, or a challenge with the, with the demand for that. And so I think while we need to look at resources, we also need to make sure that we say thank you and show the proper respect and appreciation to our educators as well. All right, so while, while John and uh, Rick agreed earlier, we're going to have to remember that because the next issue they will differ greatly on. Uh, we have, if high wages and low wages continue and there's a big gap in between, do we need to examine the issue of minimum wage, particularly as we think about future work and jobs that could, could exist in the future? John? Well, uh, I think that this is a well-plowed field. Um, the, every time a little sprout comes up, we prowl it back over. Uh, the debate's been going on for decades. My own view is that, it, that raising the minimum wage is the worst possibly tailored plan if you're trying to address people who are low income. Uh, people who work at minimum wage are not necessarily the people who are poor. Most of the people who are poor for chronic period, lengthy periods of time, uh, they're not working full time at any wage. They're working part time or not at all. So we want to create jobs. 
We want to create opportunities to move up to the next level. There are people who support themselves and, and families on minimum wage or shortly or high, somewhat higher than minimum wage, but there are also lots of people who work at minimum wage who, do, who are not in that situation, who are getting their first job, they're 16, they're 17, they're 18, they're 19, they don't come from low-income families. So getting economic opportunity right, creating opportunities for higher paying jobs is distinguishable from whether to raise the minimum wage. Now, some conservatives do panic too much about minimum wage increases and, propose, and suggest all sorts of you know, gigantic, horrible things that will happen in the labor market. The truth is that the number of jobs affected by the minimum wage is pretty small. So the effects, positive or negative, are relatively small in the whole scheme of things. The real issue is putting capital in the hands of workers. Capital is what makes labor more valuable, which leads to labor being more highly paid. Capital can be physical capital, it could be tools and equipment, but mostly now it's human capital. It's what's in your head and what you're capable of doing with your hands. To the extent that we improve education, to the extent that we incentivize capital investment of all kinds, wages will rise. And the minimum wage will be a fairly minor part of the story, whatever you think of it. Rick, I have the small feeling you're gonna disagree. Yes, but not as much as you think again. Um, I agree with um, uh, John that minimum wage is only part of the issue and that the infrastructure and the capacity to give people uh, a, a globally competitive and quality education is, is in many respects more important. But, I, but where I disagree with John is uh, I, I think it is well plowed ground and I think the ground every time it's plowed comes back with the, 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 same, the same answer and that is that boosting the wage floor, if you do it incrementally, that is I'm not in favor of putting it up to $15, but if you're talking about a boost to $10, it would affect approximately a million people in North Carolina. That is not a small amount of folks. And 85% of those folks would be 20 years or older. It would be good for businesses in that, uh, the, uh, the, I think the critics have always said, and made this sort of simplistic argument, and John alluded to it, that if you increase wages, it's just going to be offset by, by cuts to jobs. And that has never actually really happened. And raising the minimum wage would create, in my view, more demand, more customers, more sales, larger profits, cycling back in, creating bigger revenue, which creates the, the capacity, the capital, to create better institutions, more sustained functioning for public schools and universities and community colleges, and I don't see a downside to that cycle. So where I disagree with John is, is I do believe in raising the minimum wage, and I think it's a positive for workers, a positive for the institutions and the state, and a positive for businesses. But where I do agree with John is it's secondary in a sense uh, to the larger issue of investment and public investment in the things that will make this state strong. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to assume this is not an issue at the legislature. Well, I think one of the perspectives that I had when I looked at the Emerging Institute study with Mike Walden, when you look at the list of jobs that are most likely to be replaced by automation, uh, they're jobs of people who make the minimum wage. And automation is a, is a reflex of increased productivity. How can we be more productive? Um, so I think that the, the implication, at least, would be to, that if, you, if the government came in and, and raised wages, the private sector, and, and maybe this is what John would, would argue, would say, if we're on the path to autom automation, does this not speed it up? In other words, is, ra is not raising the minimum wage somehow uh, speeding up the road to automation for people that work, say, at McDonald's? Speaker Mark? You know, I, I, have, I have owned and I presently own businesses. I know what it means to sign the front side of a paycheck, to actually have employees. And I have never had any employee that's worked for uh, minimum wage. They've all gotten paid more than that. Uh, but my experience when it comes to the minimum wage has been that it is a starting salary. Uh, that's generally where it is. It's somewhere, it's somewhere that folks start and they advance from there. Nobody wants to stay at a minimum wage and, and, and uh, that, that's not a place where folks want to work and that's not a place where folks would generally stay in a career if you look at studies across the board. Uh, but I do think that it's, you know, we have a federal minimum wage in place and North Carolina, I would predict, would continue to follow that. Gentlemen, for folks that don't know these studies inside and out, they don't know the, the depth of economics that this requires, how are they supposed to make sense of two very different opinions on an issue like minimum wage? Minimum wage is a fascinating issue, and the more you read about the last 10 or 15 years of research, the more confused you will get. Uh, 
the, 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 there used to be a pretty strong consensus that increases in the minimum wage benefited the people who kept jobs because they got more money and then the, hurt the people who lost jobs because people would clearly lose jobs. The debate was only about the magnitude of the loss. In the early 90s, there began to be studies that were using uh, cross-border differences, you know, people who have been on one side or the other of a particular border so they could try to study the effects of changing the minimum wage in a kind of a quasi-laboratory environment. There was an initial set of studies that suggested that the minimum wage didn't actually reduce employment as had long been believed. Those studies were largely debunked, in my view, uh, by the academic community later. Now, I'm not saying there isn't disagreement on the minimum wage. There is. But it is almost... I would definitely disagree with uh, Rick's claim that it has never reduced jobs. Most studies of the minimum wage shows that it does reduce employment. Now, the debate is about how much of the employment and whether it is worth doing. There are scholars who study this issue and say, yes, you lose some jobs. Some jobs uh, become automated. There are some other things that happen that may be deleterious to the people who get dislocated, but it's worth it because other people make more money. Now, I could recognize that are, I wouldn't agree with that argument, but I would recognize that it is relevant to the economics of the situation. Obviously, when you, ra rage, when, when you raise wages above the market uh, prevailing wage, it will have some dislocation effects. There are people who are employable at or slightly above the minimum wage because that's how much their value added is because they're probably young and they have not a lot of experience. They don't ge generate you know, 15 or $20 worth of work uh, for the, for the uh, 15 or $20 worth of sales for the work they do. So when you raise the wage to $10 an hour, some of them are not employable. That is absolutely the case. The dispute is about the magnitude of that effect and whether it is worth doing for the consequences that are positive for the people who get more money. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to sort of turn a bit, though, uh, to, the, to, to the larger point that John's alluded to, um, and that is beyond the issue of the minimum wage, how do we help... Um, everybody in our state sort of navigate this economy. If we're not careful and if we don't use the public policy levers, then what's going to happen is we're going to enhance this disparity that already exists and we've all sort of recognized it exists. Uh, it exists uh, between uh, uh, the genders in terms of pay in North Carolina. It exists certainly in racial minorities. It exists in urban rural. So how do we sort of deal with that? One of those is um, clearly a discussion you all have had earlier today, and that is the necessity for public policy levers to encourage lifelong learning and the ability to transition between jobs, the ability to learn all of those skills that allow us to even start off. Um, and and the, the, the disparities in the economy don't affect everyone equally. As I suggested, there's certainly big disparities with the young um, and, and their opportunities um, in K-12 education across the state, or we wouldn't have had Leandro going on for 20 years. Uh, we recognize that there are disparities for seniors um, and by the year, I think one of the reports that we had to look at for today uh, said that by the year um, 2025, uh, the population in the United States age 60 and older will grow by 70 percent. And we're right in that middle of that in North Carolina. And they're going to be dramatically affected as they need to work longer and need to have a transferability of skills. And we don't have that system set up very well at all um, throughout the state. Second is the ability to connect all of our regions to the, the global economy, and the legislature has been working on that, but I think needs to devote significantly more time and resources to that high-speed internet capacity uh, across the board. And third, I think, is uh, not to belabor an old issue, uh, but when there are going to be a number of people that are going to be unemployed, as John suggests, in different ways, then we ought to have a safety net that supports unemployment insurance now that we've recovered on the debt to the federal government. We ought to be reconsidering the decisions that now have us as one of the worst unemployment systems in terms of duration and benefits because so many of our people at different points in time are going to need it in different parts of the state. It's time to re-examine that and put us back in balance as well. Yes. Tim, can I, can yeah, I respond one thing? A couple of things. Look at where North Carolina was eight years ago and look at where we are now. We now have more people working in this state than at any time in our state's history. Unemployment is down, taxes are lower, economic growth continues to increase. And if you think about what we're talking about now, we're, we're talking about the, the rate of growth between rural and urban, not the fact that you have continued decline. And that's due in large part to, to a number of things. But I would submit to you the new regulatory environment, the, the reforms that have been made in recent years, lowering taxes, 
Those things aren't accidental. The, the economy continues to improve, and we continue to improve as compared to other states. And I'll point out the states where the minimum wage has been talked about and, and, folk, and there's been proposals to raise it are generally states that are not doing as well as we are now. I don't think our goal should be to struggling about the, the low amount. We should try to get everybody up to as high as they can possibly earn. And that's increasing the economy overall so that all of our workers see a growth and see a continued uh, prosperity. And that's what we're continuing to work on. Good. Good. Let's, uh, let's talk about what might need to be done. Uh, if we talk about future work, and automation is one of the things we keep hearing about today, robots. Uh, will we see robots at the legislature someday? Maybe a, a robotic speaker of the house someday. <laughs> robotic news anchors. What am I going to do when the robot takes my job? But do we need to change laws? You know, I know there's a lot of talk about the last year. Part of the economic investment bill was about changing, in, you know, ways individuals can invest. I mean, do we need to look at labor laws or other laws that we need to change? Absolutely. Um, you know, the legislature is going to have to constantly be reassessing uh, the economic environment in which we're in and how creative people are becoming. Um, what makes this tough, just to be quite frank with you, is how deeply um, embedded special interests are into the licensing laws of the state of North Carolina, into associational laws. So when new ideas pop up, they're really easy to get smacked down by the interests that have done things the way they've done things for 100 years. I think as a policymaker, the greatest difficulty of making change is that we've done things the way we've done them for a very long time, and that worked for us, and now it's time to change a lot of the things we do, maybe the way we fund things, the way we teach things, and there is a lot of established um, support for how we've always done things. And it's very, that is really the challenge, I think, for the General Assembly is not knowing what to do, but having the political will to do it. What would you specifically like to see? Well, I'm gonna say this. If you look, when it comes to government and public policy, government generally is behind business. Uh, one thing we've shown is government cannot slow down technology. Rick may remember we had a bill a few years ago mandating, mandating what, CFL light bulbs. Now, now it's LED. And, and, and so the, the, when government's trying to push something sometimes, it's, it can't keep up with the cutting edge of technology. I think the best thing a lot of times government can do is to get out of the way and let, let, let the uh, private sector move forward. Let technology grow and, and, and support that and not get in the way with regulatory barriers. Rick, anything with labor laws or laws that you'd like to see changed? Yeah, I, I, first to comment on, on what uh, Speaker Moore said. I mean, I, there certainly is a point at which uh, government regulation can be overbearing and counterproductive, and we've actually joined with uh, the John Locke Foundation in suggesting the legislature continue its review of occupational licensing and board issues and fees, because where there is not a legitimate public health policy and safety policy, they can be barriers to, to entrepreneurship and poor folks generally entering into the workforce. That having been said, the market does not, and the market serves one function, and it certainly is to grow the economy. But when one of the major public policies is dealing with the inequities we talked about, the market's created those, the market ain't gonna solve those. That is where the role of government is, to create an economic opportunity that is available for everybody. And that means a recognizing distinct differences between different portions of the state and different segments of the state, and having to have the role of government to be the cop in the middle that actually regulates the flow of traffic so that everyone has an opportunity. I guess the last thing I would say about this is there's a, some really good studies in the materials that the Institute put forward to read, and one of them is a Future Work Skills 2020 report. And, and, and we were talking backstage that it's helpful to have data, but if you don't look at it and don't use it, that can be uh, not particularly useful. And it talks about the six drivers of change as the extreme longevity that's now in, in, incorporated in our population, the rise of smart machines, the new media ecology, superstructured organizations, globally connected issues, and, competitive, uh, and computational issues. And it then lists and suggests 10 skills for a future workforce, some of which get back to Senator Barefoot's issue about curriculum and how we go about it. Um, and so I think it's important for us to look at the data, look at the research as policymakers to become more attuned to consider best practices in research, despite how it may fall on our ideology, and to try to move forward as best we can in a consensus way together, because sustained stability for the state 
beats this sort of every two and every four year whiplash back and forth, which I think is, is destructive, both for the politic of the state and for the people of the state. John, anything you would change? Oh, lots. We don't have enough time. Um, what, here's what I would add to what, what Rick just said, what everybody just said, to keep things in perspective. Conservatives, liberals, people across the political spectrum agree that the state, local <coughs> governments, uh, the public sector in general, play an important role in building the capital that leads to successful economies, to transitioning to new jobs, et cetera. But it's important to remember that private investment is way bigger. It is a much bigger driver of what happens in the economy than public investment. There is such a thing as public investment, but it is like this, and private investment is like this. So you have to be concerned about the effectiveness of the dollars that we spend on public assets, like roads and schools and colleges and so forth, but it's also important, it's not just equally important, it's somewhat more important to make sure that you're not discouraging private investment or shunting it into ways that it wouldn't have otherwise done because of public policies that discourage certain kinds of industries from cropping up, as we were just talking about with regard to um, occupational licensing and other kinds of rules that block new technologies. I'm fundamentally a very optimistic person. That's because I'm a realistic person. Most predictions about the world's going to be awful in 20 years and nobody's going to have a job, most of those are always, they're wrong. They've been wrong for 150 years. And the reason they're wrong is because people figure things out. They solve problems. They figure out new ways to use the savings that come from saving money from automation to create new jobs. But that process requires a dynamism. It requires the a willingness of people to take risks and to make profits if they succeed and not make profits if they lose. And that private sector driven process is the, is the main story. It's supported by the public sector. Public sector creates assets that the private sector can't do and regulates in ways to ensure that there's a true meeting of the minds and so forth. There, there are reasons for the public sector to be involved, but mostly they're supporting the main event, which is private investment in new industry. We need to make sure there aren't ob obstacles whether they're tax or regulatory or thinking that prevent us from getting to that new and very promising future. Okay. Am I on? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Terrific. All right. I want to pick up on John's can-do attitude. We want to play a game called can-do, can-do it right. So. Not surprisingly, given the last panel's focus on adaptation in the workforce delivery system, we got a lot of questions here for you that are all about how we do that adaptation. I'm going to ask each of you a question. I want to give you to give me a really short answer. The question is, how do we do it right? So John, you made reference to the need to get young people thinking about educational choices earlier, as early as middle school. But you also cautioned against the German system. How do we do it right? I think that was Chad that was making that argument. Well, I'm sorry. The questioner said I should ask you. Well, of course. I have all the answers. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. Chad, do you want to answer the question? I'm sorry. You have to. The question is, you, we suggest that we want students to begin thinking about choices, workforce choices earlier, and yet we want to be careful not to have the German system where students are tracked too early. How do we do that right? How do we expose young people to the options without boxing them into choices they're too young to make? Yeah, we want to keep free will in education. Here's how we do it right. It's leadership at the local level. Teachers, principals, uh, the guidance counselors they have, they've got to tell these students how important the decisions they're making on the classes they're taking are in middle school and high school. Terrific. Speaker Moore, how do we do it right? We want to modernize our schools all across North Carolina. How do we balance the cost of modernizing them with the realities of our fiscal constraints? Well, I think we also look for efficiencies. I've heard a lot of studies where you know, going to electronic textbooks, for example, instead of the traditional printed textbooks as a way of saving money. But I think also allowing some creativity and ingenuity in the local school districts is a good thing. I've, gen I've always believed local control is the best control. And empowering those school districts, those school boards, those school leaders to make the decisions for what best suits those particular districts. 
uh, and I think also experimentation. I think uh, the early college programs that are being done across the state are a way to increase efficiency. Students are graduating with a high school diploma and an associate's degree, and it also is an opportunity for them to get a career track in place. It's saving money, it's saving those families money, and it's also helping direct those students into a career that will help them. And in turn, the more you can do that, the more efficient you are. So Rick, I'd like you to pick up on that theme. This question was directed to you. The questioner wanted to know, other than money, what are the factors that contribute to the lack of capacity for public school teachers? Again, really asking, how do we unleash that creativity? And is it only about pay? What are the other factors? Well, it's not only about pay, but at some sustainable base level, it will be in terms of, of people who have career choices to go into other fields and trying to get the best and the brightest to be uh, our educators. But I think there are other issues. Um, respect, and I think Speaker Moore talked about that, um, respect for the profession, increased prestige for the profession. I think understanding that education is a lifelong process and it starts with quality, access to quality early childhood, educational capacities, and seeing us put the resources and, and the, the, the ability into that, which then, if we stay really true to that, um, creates far less problems down the line in elementary, middle, and high school. Um, uh, we can sort of either pay now or pay later. Um, and, and, and so I think that's part of the issue. And I think fundamentally at the end as well is a commitment and a, and a sustained commitment to a long-term plan that is a bipartisan plan of education. Education should not be a partisan issue. And in the countries where it is succeeding in the ways uh, that are creating dynamic, vibrant economies, whether we use that Finland as an example or others, it is because it is the one issue that the politic body has gotten past uh, the partisanship of, of that and have created a sustainable long-term vision for their country. We don't have that right now in North Carolina and we need it. John, so why don't you end on this note? You talked about the distinct roles of the private and public sector and yet we've heard time and time again today about the need for the conversation to be symbiotic. How do we set up an infrastructure in which our educational system is actually producing what our private sector needs in order to be successful? Well, that's a great question. It comes up a lot. People, people often tend to blame, you know, well, the colleges aren't providing the skills that the, public, the private sector really needs, or the private sector is not hiring. They're not giving us information. They're not telling us. The truth is that the private sector is an abstraction. It's a group of people who are making bets on what's going to work and what's not going to work, and they try products and they fail, they, they succeed. Nobody really knows what all the jobs are going to look like in 25 years. They don't know. They really don't. So pretending that it's just lack of planning, we're not talking to each other enough, is a mistake. We need a flexible process with a constant feedback mechanism. We should recognize the community colleges in North Carolina will prepare uh, kids very well, very well, for jobs that everybody assumes are going to be available in 10 years that won't be just to stipulate that that will happen. Just like great businesses create products that flop and they have to learn from that and try something else. Similarly, there has to be some adaptation on the part of the private sector. The private sector can't keep complaining, well, we're not getting the workers that we want from the schools and the colleges. Well, what exactly do you want? We need to have a, there does need to be this circular information flow, public to private to public to private to public to private. It's a constant process. I do think that having more opportunities for students to choose different paths, as we were talking about earlier, is helpful in that regard. I do think we can learn from Germany. I do think we can learn from Korea and Japan. I do think we can learn from the Netherlands. But I can tell you right now that in all of those countries, probably something like right now this afternoon or yesterday or tomorrow, they're having a conference to, dis to discuss what they can learn from America. Because a lot of those countries are struggling more than we are with many of the problems that you've talked about throughout the conference. Well, I want to thank this panel. Let me just say there are a number of entries that came in through the app that were not questions, but were actually words of commendation to this panel. One person suggested that perhaps UNC TV's North Carolina channel send this tape to the US Congress and show them how to have a conversation about the future of work. Thank you all very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, Tim.